Watch this. You asked several times, so we are fact-checking the latest congressional ad in the race for United States Senate, this ad from incumbent Senator Mike Crapo. Thousands of Idahoans are starting to see special rebate checks from the state of Idaho. But what about Idahoans who aren't required to file taxes? Can they get a rebate to battle inflation? What were you doing 100 years ago today? Is that crickets I hear? Well, since almost none of us were around, we thought we would put October 17th in perspective by looking back on the big stories from this day in 1922. And a happy Monday to you all. Glad you could join us here. We're on the final road to Election Day, coming up very quickly, November 8th. We'll tell you that a thousand times between now and then. And ahead of that day, our text line and inbox are full of comments and questions about all the races. But a major topic, as always, political advertising and if the claims in the TV ad you watch here on 7, if they're true. Here are just a few of the text messages we've received in just the last few days. Folks wondering about the Mike Crapo ad talking about the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. Now, this is a commercial you've likely seen a few times here on 7, so let's talk about the claims made in the advertisement. We're going to give you the context now that you need to make sense of the claims and the background featured in the ad. The latest political ad from Senator Mike Crapo takes on a familiar tone for GOP politicians, questioning the work and investments into the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. Joe Biden, Chuck Schumer, and Nancy Pelosi just supersized the IRS to get more money to spend. The opening claim here touches on the us versus them mentality of Idaho versus the Democrat-controlled House, Senate, and presidency in Washington. The supersized the IRS comment is in reference to the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, the massive congressional deal that was approved strictly on party lines this year. Now, the act includes an $80 billion allocation to the IRS for a large variety of investments. And Crapo implies that Democrats approved heavy investments into the IRS to get more money to spend. It's unclear exactly what Crapo means by that sentence, but he's likely referencing a popular GOP point this election season. Democrats are investing billions into auditing Americans and their taxes to generate more tax dollars for Democrat back spending programs. The IRS commissioner, Charles Reddick, wrote to Congress in August to tell them about the challenges the IRS is facing and why they need more investments. Reddick wrote, quote, for too long, the agency has not had the resources that it needs to ensure the tax laws are enforced fairly and that Americans receive the level and quality of service they deserve. Republicans have pushed the idea that increased investments into the IRS will end up with middle and low income Americans being nickeled and dimed through audits. Again, to pay for Democrat back spending packages. Now, the IRS has said publicly and bluntly this is not the plan. Reddick told Congress that the IRS is focused on top earners in large corporations so they can hold them accountable and make sure that they're paying their fair share. He wrote, quote, large corporate and high net worth taxpayers often engage teams of sophisticated representatives who pursue unsettled or sometimes questionable interpretations of tax law. The integrity and fairness of our tax administrative system relies upon the ability of our agency to maintain a strong, visible, robust enforcement presence directed to these and other similarly situated taxpayers when they are noncompliant. $80 billion, five times the current budget of the IRS, 87,000 new recruits, an IRS larger than the Pentagon. We touched on the $80 billion figure, but for more context, let's be clear that $80 billion is meant to be budgeted over the next decade, not just over the next year. So breaking down that $80 billion, the Congressional Research Service wrote, quote, that the IRA would give the IRS $45.6 billion for tax enforcement activities, such as hiring more enforcement agents, providing legal support, and investing in investigative technology. $25.3 billion is set for general IRS support support, like covering facilities costs, postage, security, stuff like that. And the remaining funds are for technology and service upgrades, like for antiquated computer systems that the IRS still uses. That 87,000 new recruits implies that an army of auditors will be hired to audit Americans. And while it is true that increased funding will certainly include hiring more agents to audit Americans, the IRS wrote to Congress that they needed staffing assistance across the board. They're not looking to hire 87,000 auditors. 
Commissioner Reddick wrote, quote, the IRS has fewer frontline experienced examiners in the field than at any time since World War II and fewer employees than at any time since the 1970s. Advances in technology have been helpful but have not kept pace with the ever-increasing responsibilities and challenges facing the IRS. As a result, he wrote, the IRS has for too long been unable to pursue meaningful, impactful examinations of large corporate and high net worth taxpayers to ensure they're paying their fair share. An IRS larger than the Pentagon. Back to this quickly, the IRS is looking to hire a significant number of employees because, according to the IRS, an estimated 52,000 out of their 83,000 employees are eligible to retire or resign within the next six years. So that accounts for about 63% of the IRS workforce. So hiring is a battle for the IRS. But what is the workforce at the Pentagon? Well, the Pentagon reports that they house approximately 24,000 military and civilian employees and approximately 3,000 non-defense support personnel. So clearly less than the current IRS staff of 83,000, but those IRS staffers are housed across the country. And the Pentagon includes the Department of Defense, which has 2.91 million service members and civilians. The DOD is also the largest employer in the world. Again, housed at the Pentagon. So saying that the IRS would be bigger than the Pentagon, well, it's just a very qualified statement. So it's up to you to decide what the claims in the ad mean to you. Is there something else you want us to check on? Well, you can text us anytime and be sure to check out the KTVB election guide right now. If you have any questions about voting or the election, there's a good chance your answer is there right now at KTVB.com. Uh, viewer question time. We saw a lot of questions over the weekend from folks wondering about the special rebate check sent out by the state of Idaho. You may remember during the special legislative session in September, Idaho lawmakers approved sending Idahoans a special rebate check because of the large budget surplus. So everyone who filed taxes in 2020, 2021 in Idaho is eligible for a minimum of $300 or 10% of their tax return from 2020, 2021. Now lawmakers and the governor wanted to send Idahoans their money back to help battle inflation costs on just about everything. So as the latest numbers from Friday, 425,000 special session rebates totaling $212.6 million have been processed. And the Idaho State Tax Commission says they remain confident that most rebates will be sent to Idaho tax taxpayers who filed on time before Thanksgiving with as many as 575,000 checks being sent out before the end of October. Brings us to this viewer question. It says, hey Joe, what about all the disabled Americans that don't file taxes but still have to pay for the high prices of fuel and food? Where is our $300? Well, that's a good question. So if you don't have to file taxes, that doesn't mean you aren't getting a special rebate check. And we read right here from the State Tax Commission website. Any Idahoan who was a full year resident in 2020 and 2021 and who also filed an income, an Idaho individual income return or Form 24 for those years is eligible for the rebate. So Form 24 is your answer if you don't file income taxes in Idaho. What is that? Well, Form 24 is how Idahoans who don't file taxes get the grocery tax credit. So if you did that in the correct time frame, again, being a full time resident in 2020 and 21, you will get the check. Well, this year, some of Idaho's sturgeon were in major trouble. The warmer than average temperatures were making waters too warm and oxygen levels were low. And as a result, fish started dying. Idaho Fish and Game identified 20 individuals that died over a few weeks in what they say was an unprecedented event here in Idaho. In response, they closed sturgeon fishing on part of the CJ Strike Reservoir. So we wanted to check back in with them and see how the sturgeon are doing now. The conservation closure uh, that Fish and Game had in place uh, for that portion of CJ Strike Reservoir, um, it was in place until the prescribed end date, which was September 25th. Since the uh, closure has been lifted, uh, sturgeon fishing has resumed on the reservoir and we've received no additional reports of sturgeon mortalities. Brian Pearson works with Idaho Fish and Game, and he says there were no additional fatalities while the closure was in place, which is great news. And while the fish are out of hot water for now, we asked what the outlook for this area looks like for the next few years and excuse me, next few weeks and into next year. Typically, we're seeing these conditions crop up in the warmer months. Um, you know, obviously, this was an un unprecedented uh, 
mortality event for sturgeon. It's not something that we have seen before to this extent. Right now, again, reservoir and con reservoir conditions are are in a good place. If we do see these conditions crop up again um, in this upcoming summer or in following summers, we're going to be able to uh, respond more quickly and really uh, evaluate this scientifically as to whether, you know, uh, these angling effort does contribute when these sorts of conditions exist on CJ Strike Reservoir. So when this whole thing first happened, several sport fishing outfitters and fishing guides said that people on social media were blaming them for the closure. But Pearson says the temperatures and the low oxygen, those were the main culprit. I think it's important to note um, that this is uh, more so an issue of environmental conditions than of uh, angling effort. And, uh, you know, we don't take uh, these situations where we remove angling opportunity lightly. Uh, but in this case, it was uh, the prudent thing to do to protect a resource that was tr that is treasured by Idaho anglers. And it's, you know, if, if these conditions uh, reoccur in the future, it's something that we will evaluate once again. And while this mortality event was unprecedented, Pearson says this die-off was not at a population level. 20 large surgeon died in this event, and while that number is not in the hundreds or thousands, these 50 to 70 year old fish will be difficult to replace. It's, you know, a travesty really, uh, because these fish do take so long to grow to those sizes. But that being said, you know, 20 fish is really constitutes just a, for, at a population level, constitutes a, a pretty small sliver of the total population, um, which is in that stretch of river estimated to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,000. Um, so at a population level, it is not a super big concern. It is a, a valued resource and it's something that, that we care deeply about and our constituents care deeply about. Fall activities can be really uplifting to the spirit. They offer a great chance to enjoy the outdoors before the weather gets too cold. But a couple of guys are smashing the normal expectations of what those activities can look like. And as you'll see, it's definitely giving their moods a boost. You know what boosts our mood? To hear from you. Yeah, that's right. Send us a text. Include your thoughts about today's show or questions or comments, really whatever you got. Here's our number. 208-321-5614. Please be sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. We'll get to some of these on screen at the end of the half hour. It's almost time to be picking out your pumpkins for the year. And if you ask my fiance, that should have happened months ago. But along with all the other pumpkin patch activities, there are some really great options here in the Treasure Valley. And you know, you can do things like hay rides, rope courses, pony rides, even blast some apples. Well, there were a couple of guys in Eagle who blasted more than just apples. They launched entire pumpkins with air cannons. And it was something of a contest that Idaho Life reporter John Miller visited in the year 1999. Here's that story of the guy who's always sure to win by a long shot.
You start with the catapult. He counters with the uh, pumpkin cannon. And you recounter with the FR-800. We waited all year for this, John. Jeez, I know. I mean, I pull up and I see this thing. It's like, oh my gosh, it's like the military stopped by. Now we got competition. The FR-800. <laughs> revenge. Rod's revenge. Hey, it's over the fence! Yeah. 800 cubic feet of air. Packed behind an eight-pound pumpkin in a 600-gallon tank. And then kablooey. Never knew air was so darn powerful, Rod. And fun. Oh, yeah. Woohoo! It's been in the works for 12 months. Ever since last year, when Rod's lowly catapult oh. was crushed by Chuck Meisner's cannon. Look who's doing the crushing now. How about a double barrel? So you pretty excited? Darn excited. Those guys right there, yeah, their days are numbered. It's a short life for a pumpkin that goes into the FR-800. There you go. And a short life for all that stands before it. Geez, you almost hit the truck. I tried. <laughs> now Chuck's trying to keep pace with the new king of the cornfield. Stand back. Stand back. Rod's in the game. <laughs> John Miller, Idaho's News Channel 7. In our busy and fast-moving world, sometimes it's hard to keep track of the news just from a few days or a few weeks ago, let alone a few years ago. So we want to take the time to share what's going on in parts of the Treasure Valley 100 years ago today. Just a little perspective as you're driving home today. Think about what this place was like 100 years ago. 
It's the Caldwell Tribune for October 17th, 1922. Semi-weekly and only $3 per year. The big headline. County prisoners make clean break Sunday evening. Four county prisoners escaped from the county jail sometime early Sunday evening by breaking down the door and making a clean getaway. This wholesale escape created considerable comment in the business section of Caldwell Monday. Without exception, those who discussed the matter felt that, regardless of cost, the time has come when a new county jail is an imperative need in Canyon County. Jailbreaks are of frequent occurrence and county officers, it is conceded, are helpless to prevent it without placing guards there 24 hours every day. In political news, Bora agreed to buy a huge crowd here Thursday. The state senator proves power with people by attracting the big audience. No politics discussed. Over in Parma, the seniors of Parma High School are busy working on their play, a prairie rose, which will present in a few weeks. Looking at those classifieds. Wanted, someone to dig potato crop for one third the yield. For information, call 492R3. And found, bicycle at Memorial Park. Owners can have same by proving property and paying for this ad. Wanted to loan a thousand big ones. Inquire, J.R. Lonekey. From the kitchen cabinet, it is wise to remember that the first meal should be a happy, quiet one, starting the family off to their various duties in a cheerful frame of mind. And finally, a story to tickle your funny bone. Motorist finds all fade against him. 13 and Friday proved a combination that L.R. Jones couldn't beat. Friday, October 13th, he drove a new Ford car into Caldwell with only one license plate. Jack Watkins, chief of police, became curious, then suspicious, then authoritative, and placed Jones under arrest. He came before Judge H.D. Harger, entered a plea of guilty, and paid a fine. And last of all, his fine, the judge thought, should probably be $13. That's all that's fit to print for the Caldwell Tribune, October 17th, 1922. Someone texted in and asked Joe to always read the news like that. That was fantastic. Hey, a reminder, I hope you do. Uh, as a reminder that it is still fall, our days are getting so much shorter. Sun coming up after 8 a.m., going down before 7 p.m. We've been enjoying these warm fall afternoons, but big changes are in store for this weekend. So get ready for a shock to the system as finally this high pressure ridge will be broken down and it'll be replaced by a cool low pressure trough that'll bring in not just the cooler temperatures, but also wind and finally some precipitation. So this is a complete pattern flip all across the United States looking for warmer temperatures in the eastern half, the cooler weather dipping down into the Pacific Northwest and the rain that we've waited all of October for 26 days without measurable precipitation for the Boise area. Enjoy tomorrow and through the rest of the work week highs staying in the 70s and then we flip things over to snow, at least for the mountain areas as we get into next weekend. Here's a peak at next weekend for the Boise area. Much cooler temperatures and not just uh, cooler, but also a little windy, a little raw with showers coming down and snow at the higher elevations. Cooler and breezy comes Sunday. It will be a bit of a shock to the system, something to get used to. Seven day forecast looking very nice for the rest of the week, but again, much needed rain in the forecast. And it looks like once we get those cooler temperatures, Joe, they'll be sticking around with us for the final week of October and then we head into November. There's the big cool down. There's the big cool down. Oh, finally, I don't know about you, Bree, but I've been waiting to wear my like my winter outfits and to pretend to like light the fire. So sweat a weather. Sweat a weather. Yeah. It's, it's hard to do that when it's 80 degrees in October. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Bree. We'll talk soon. Well, Boise soccer stars making a big impact on the international stage. Sammy Smith is playing for the United States national soccer team in the FIFA U-17 Women's World Cup in India. She is a star at Boise High School, so from the Treasure Valley to the world stage. And today, the United States team took on Morocco. They won 4-0. Nil, not zero. Smith scored two goals in the game, which in soccer is called a brace. The goals were set up almost identically, an absolutely stellar job for Smith. And we'll continue to cheer for you here on 7, and we'll bring you guys updates when we have them. It's a goal!
All right. We, uh, we got a big game of Monday Night Football to watch. Go Broncos. But before we do to that, this person says, will we have to pay taxes on that rebate check? That's from Betty. Betty, you will not have to pay state income taxes um, on this rebate check. It is not qualified as something that you would have to take in as extra income. It's a rebate check. So your state taxes will not impact that. So you just get the money back. Uh, this person says, yes, do the old time newsy thing more often, CR and Boise. We like doing them. So I'm glad you guys enjoy watching them. So we will we'll keep doing them. All right, this person says, heading back to California for the winter, but I'll certainly miss the KTVB 5 o'clock news, Joe's clarification of the IRS funding, the Sturgeon survival, and pumpkin launch prepped me well for the trip to Monterey. See you in June, Tom. Tom, drive safe. We'll see you back in June. You can always watch this, too, on YouTube if you're missing us. This person says, the pumpkin cannon story inspired potato cannons back then. Good times. And only one black guy. That's Andrea in Meridian. And I think we've got time for one more. This person says, where's Brian? Where is Brian? Who even knows? I know where he is. He'll be back later this week. All right, Broncos country, let's ride.